Hi, welcome to this MCQ Revision Blast. We're going to be taking a look here at approaches. How this works is there'll be 15 questions. They're going to be multiple choice questions. I'll read through the question. I suggest you pause the video when I finish reading through. Uh, decide what your answer is and keep your score as you go along. All right, first question then. Which of the following occurred around 1913? A, Freud established the psychodynamic approach. B. Watson and Skinner established the behaviourist approach. C. Wundt opened the first experimental psychology lab. Or D. Rogers and Maslow established the humanistic approach. So pause your video. The correct answer that I'm looking for there is B. That's Watson and Skinner established the behaviourist approach around 1913. So in terms of timeline, and you are expected to know, of course, the history of psychology, We've got Freud there in the 1900s, which was the establishment of the psychodynamic approach. We've got Wundt's experimental psychology lab in 1879. We've got Rogers and Maslow in the humanistic approach in the 1950s. So that isn't the entirety in terms of the history of psychology. You are also expected to know, for example, about cognitive approach, cognitive neuroscience, SLT, etc. But it does give you an idea in terms of what you are required to know uh, in terms of questions um, think of MCQs perhaps similar to this one or maybe questions asking you to put the timeline of psychology in order. Question two in the diagram what would go in the star so if you look on the diagram there's a star next to the bell I would like to know please what that bell would be labelled as is it a neutral stimulus b unconditioned stimulus c conditioned stimulus or D, controlled stimulus. Pause the video. The correct answer that I'm looking for there is A, neutral stimulus. So this is basically uh, an outline of Pavlov's research into classical conditioning, where you have the neutral stimulus initially producing no response, but after multiple pairings with an unconditioned stimulus, the, condi uh, the neutral stimulus becomes the conditioned stimulus on its own, producing the conditioned response of salivation. I put D there on the board. D there is controlled stimulus, just because it's a term that students often use instead of conditioned stimulus because they get it slightly confused. So Pavlov, of course, is named on your specification. You are expected to be able to outline the work of Pavlov and Skinner and also potentially discuss the contributions to psychology that they've made. Three. Which statement describes the term negative reinforcement? So I'll just give you a moment just to read through those. If you want an extra challenge, can you think what the other two statements on there are? Pause your video. Right, the correct answer there is C. So your extra challenge, A was positive reinforcement, B was punishment, and C is negative reinforcement. So negative reinforcement is an important one. Often students pick out B for negative reinforcement because the negative part of it, they just assume that it's punishment, where of course it's not. So positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement increase the likelihood of a behavior reoccurring, whereas punishment decreases the likelihood of a behavior reoccurring. So that's an interesting response you could use if potentially asked between the difference between, let's say, punishment and negative reinforcement. Four, which statement about social learning theory, SLT, is incorrect? A, it rests on the idea of observational learning. B, it focuses on the behaviour performed by models. C, it's part of the behaviourist approach. D, it involves four mediational processes. So pause your video. Right, the correct answer that I'm looking for there is C. Again, this is a common misconception about SLT. SLT is not part of the behaviourist approach. The behaviourist approach is Pavlov and Skinner, classical conditioning and operant conditioning. The reason students sometimes get confused is behaviourism and SLT are what we call part of the learning approach. Um, in an exam in a previous season, for example, there was a question on the behaviourist approach and many, many students included the work of Bandura and SLT in their answer when, of course, it wasn't creditworthy. 
So SLT uh, is different from behaviorism in the sense it's really about D here on your slide, that it involves those mediational processes, which are certainly a cognitive element which behaviorism did not allow for. All right, which of these is not an evalu valid evaluation of SLT? A, it's supported by experimental research. B, it helped establish psychology as a science. C, it has valuable real life application. D, it is able to establish cause and effect. So pause the video. Right, the one that's not valid there is D, and we'll talk about that in a second. So in respect to A, it's supported by experimental research. Well, of course it is. The most famous of that being the work of Albert Bandura. For B, it helped establish psychology as a science. It did as part of the learning approach. Arguably, it wasn't as important in terms of development as science in, uh, as behaviorism was, because of course, behaviorism was a lot earlier than social learning theory. For valuable real life application, we often reference the watershed that's used on television. The watershed, of course, being developed um, as a result of seeing how important observational learning is. Uh, for D, it's able to establish cause and effect. This isn't entirely true. Uh, when we think about SLT in terms of criticisms, we often comment on the issue of causality. This is because it's not clear if people learn behavior from models, or maybe it's just the case that they seek out models who exhibit behavior or attitudes that they already favor. Okay, six, which part of the cognitive approach is not named on the specification? Is it A, attention, B, the role of schemas, C, the use of theoretical and computer models, D, inferences. So which one of these is not explicitly named? Right, the correct answer there is A. So on the specification, it says the study of internal mental processes. Now, attention is an internal mental process, as is, um, let's say, perception, memory, consciousness but it's not named explicitly on the specification. Schemas are named on the specification, theoretical and computer models, and how we use these to make D inferences is named on the specification. The thing that's missing there in terms of the specification is of course, the emergence of cognitive neuroscience. So just be aware, you could be asked perhaps a shorter answer question about any of these core concepts within the cognitive approach. Okay, which of these statements about the cognitive approach are correct? I'd like you to pick two of these, please. A, it is both nature and nurture. B, it emphasizes the role of nurture. C, it is both nomothetic and ideographic. D, it uses a nomothetic approach. Pause your video, I'd like the two that are correct, please. Okay, I'm looking for A and C. So we'll begin with A, which is it's both nature and nurture. So the reason it's both nature and nurture is because within the cognitive approach, it does recognize that behavior is as a result of what we call information processing. And this information processing occurs within the brain. The brain is of course biological in origin, hence nature. The cognitive approach, however, does also recognize, let's say, the influence of schemas on our behavior. Schemas, of course, are modified by experience and the environment, which is very much on the nurture side of the debate. Now, for the nomothetic and ideographic, you can argue that the cognitive approach does straddle both of these approaches because it utilizes both the experimental methods to generate general laws and principles, but does also draw on the findings of of individual case studies um, within it. Eight, which of these statements about the brain are correct? A, the parietal lobe processes sensory information. B, the occipital lobe is associated with visual perception. C, the temporal lobe processes sensory information. D, the frontal lobe is associated with visual perception. So what I'd like is I'd like two of these, please. The two statements about the brain, that is correct. Pause your video. All right, the correct answer that I'm looking for here is A and B. So the parietal lobe processes sensory information 
and then B, the occipital lobe is associated with visual perception. So the parietal lobe and the processing of sensory information, of course, is related to the fact that in the parietal lobe is where the somatosensory area is located, uh, which is just in the middle of the parietal lobe there, near what we call the central sulcus, in between the frontal lobe and the parietal lobe. And the occipital lobe there is at the back of the brain and that's associated with visual perception and this is of course the reason why when you get a young baby mothers always hold the back of the head of that child uh, this is because the skull isn't fully formed yet so any kind of bash to that area can have a resulting effect in terms of um, the child and the child could potentially go blind from that nine which of these are neurotransmitters? And I'd like you to pick two, please. We've got melatonin, dopamine, serotonin, and adrenaline. Pause the video. Okay, so the answer that I'm looking for here is both B and C. That's to say dopamine and serotonin. So this is part of the biological approach in respect to the influence of neurochemistry. Um, so within serotonin, for example, there's lots of research in terms of the chemical imbalance in serotonin in depression. That's to say it's been associated with low levels of serotonin. And this is why the drugs used to treat depression aim at increasing the amount of serotonin in the synapse, for example, through the use of SSRIs. Uh, for dopamine, we also see within schizophrenia high levels of dopamine um, as part of a symptom of schizophrenia. So again, the medication for schizophrenia seeks to lower the levels of dopamine. A and D there, of course, are not neurotransmitters, they are hormones. 10. Which of these statements about the biological approach is the least accurate? A. It adopts a reductionist perspective. B. It is entirely the nature side of the nature-nurture debate. C. It utilises scientific methods. And D. It is considered deterministic. Okay, pause your video, the least accurate one. All right, so I might have tripped you up on this one because it is B. It is entirely the nature side of the nature-nurture debate. Now, why it's very much widely accepted that the biological approach does sit on the nature side of the nature-nurture debate um, when we talk about how our behavior is determined by things like genes and neurotransmitters. There is also acknowledgement paid to the role of the environment. Uh, this is in respect to when we talk about the influence of phenotype and also kind of more modern research in terms of um, epigenetics. So to state that the biological approach is entirely on the nature side of the debate is slightly inaccurate because there is also the influence of nurture in there somewhat. All of the other statements that we've got here are very much valid. Uh, it does adopt a reductionist perspective. And one of the things I often say when talking about reductionism is that this doesn't make it in inherently bad. Science is reductionist. It's part of the scientific method to isolate cause and effect relationships. And how we re do this is by reducing things down to the simplest so we can measure the effects of it. Where the biological approach, you might argue, goes bad is when it's being a little too reductionist. Uh, that's to say, that's when we start ignoring the influence of other factors that may have been demonstrated to also have an effect. Question 11. What would go in the star in this diagram? So what I'm looking for is the age in which the phallic stage occurs in infants. You've got a choice of one to two years, three to six years, four years to puberty, or two to three years. So pause your video. Okay, the correct answer that I'm looking for there is B, that's three to six years. Now we've got three of Freud's um, psychosexual stages of development on here, just to illustrate the difference in terms of the age. Now the phallic stage, of course, is an incredibly important stage of development for young infants. Uh, this is where for young boys, for example, we'd need the resolution of the Oedipus complex in order for the boys to get, if you like, their gender. 
and it's also for boys and girls where they get their sense of morality because it's within the phallic stage that the superego develops. Those of you that have studied forensics uh, as your option in paper three, for example, know that the development of the superego is one of the ways uh, we can explain offending behaviour when we look at the different types of superego that individuals might have. 12. Who said the following? Give me a dozen healthy infants, well formed and my own specified world to bring them up in, and I'll guarantee to take any one at random and train him to become any type of specialist I might select. So using your amazing approach as knowledge, who do you think is most likely to have said that? Do you think it's Darwin, Freud, Watson or Rogers? Pause your video. OK, well done if you got it right. It was Watson. You might just have hazarded a guess there and thought that actually it's Watson because what he's saying very much fall in line with the behaviourist principles in the sense of this idea that the individual is born with this blank state, this tabula rasa, if you like, and given the right environment and the right way to raise a child, Watson, of course, asserted he could make that child anything simply through manipulation of their environment. OK, another quote. Who said the following? What I am is good enough if I would only be it openly. A. Darwin. B. Freud. C. Skinner. D. Rogers. Pause your video. OK, the correct answer there is D. So this is Rogers. This is, of course, a very humanistic statement to make because what he's talking about is the interaction between the kind of ideal self and the actual self and this idea of having incongruence between the two unless they match. So the being it openly part of them would be those two parts of the self coming together within that congruence. 14. Which of these is not a valid comparison of the behavioural and the psychodynamic approach? A. They have both used ideographic methods. B. They are both deterministic. C. They are both nature and nurture. D. They both have practical application for therapies. So which one is not valid? OK, the one there, of course, that's not valid is they are both nature and nurture. The psychodynamic approach is nature and nurture. Of course, the id part of the psyche uh, being that kind of biological drive and instinct. And then, of course, how we interact with our environment and the influence of our parents and how they raise us affecting our behaviour. And the behaviourist approach, of course, is entirely nurture. Now, they have both used ideographic methods, uh, so the favouring of the case study approach. In the behavioural approach, for example, you might recall the case study of Little Albert that you might have made reference to when studying phobias. And Freud, of course, favoured the ideographic method. They're both deterministic, but of course, they're deterministic in different ways. Um, they both say that largely our outcome in terms of our behaviour is little much down to our choice. The psychodynamic approach, of course, arguing that it's a result of um, perhaps uh, the innate drive of the id and what that wants, the result of defence mechanisms, the behavioural approach, of course, saying that our behaviour is largely determined by our environment. And then D, they both have practical application for therapies. So the psychodynamic approach, of course, has got the development of psychoanalysis as a therapy. And then for the behaviourist approach, Again, just linking back to phobias, we could talk about the use of systematic desensitisation and flooding as behavioural therapies. OK, final one, which is not a valid comparison of the biological and the cognitive approach. A, they are both ideographic. B, they both use scientific methods. C, the cognitive is more nurture than the biological approach. D, they are both reductionist. So I just want to know which one of those isn't a valid comparison. Right, the correct answer there is they are both ideographic. Uh, so the biological and cognitive approach are very much nomothetic in terms of the approach to research that they take in the sense that they rely on experimental methods and they aim to establish general laws about human behaviour.
Okay, I hope you did all right on that approaches MCQ blast. Do have a go at the other MCQ blast that's on here if you haven't already. Uh, head over to tutor2.net for any study notes that you need on approaches. And there are plenty of other MCQ blasts on here for other topics that you can have a go at.